got some lovely art uh, there behind you. Yeah, are you familiar at all with the Weechol Indians? I'm not, no. Uh, who are they? Well, they, they are a native tribe in northern Mexico, and they use peyote cactus as a sacrament, and they've been doing this for, oh, you know, forever. It's been, it's their thing. And so they have this really wonderful uh, art, very colorful, very interesting, otherworldly art. Uh, it's gotten very, very sophisticated. This is, this is kind of more original stuff actually from the 60s. And I, I love this style here, but they've got now where they've actually even created sort of tablets that are beads and they use little tiny beads to make their design unbelievable no it's a really interesting group their 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 whole dress and their weaving with all sorts of beautiful colorful geometric designs yeah fantastic do they try to depict their visions on uh, peyote in the um, paintings yeah, or? absolutely absolutely yeah let me let me just uh, show you one Please. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's that's straight out of the rabbit hole. Amazing. What do you think of that? I think it's, that's amazing. That that reminds me a lot of the kind of psychedelic art that you would see from, you know, Alex Gray or uh, people like that. Well, this is where they got a lot of their probably um, inspiration to some, other than, you know, of course, the trips themselves. But, you know, I mean, just look at how detailed that is. And this is all being done by micro, little tiny, tiny beads. And, wow. and when I'm saying how how sophisticated it's be become, the ones back on the wall are made from, it's actually called uh, a yarn painting. So it's all done with yarn that is pressed into a uh, beeswax that they lay down. That's, that's beautiful. Did you get a chance to meet with, uh, with that group of um, natives? Uh, I actually didn't. Uh, most of uh, my time, <clears throat> and I lived in Mexico for a year and a half, was in southern Mexico down mm -hmm. in Oaxaca, which is where the mushrooms grow. Mm -hmm. These folks are in northern Mexico, and they're desert people, and that's where the cactus grows. And they do a yearly pilgrimage out to collect cactus. It's really interesting. Mm. Have you had any uh, experiences with uh, San Pedro or peyote? Uh, peyote, sure. Yeah, I've, I've uh, taken it a couple of times and, and I really liked it. It was really good, but it's not something that you come across very often. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, so <laughs> it, it's one of those things, much like ayahuasca, where when you eat it, I mean, it's very, very bitter. Mm -hmm. It is very hard if you're just trying to chew it up and take it down very mm -hmm. hard to even eat it at all it's usually you get it it's dried they've sliced off the top of the cactus the cactus continues to grow they take that top which they call a button dry it mm -hmm. and then consume it and and probably one of the better ways to do it is just to uh, crumble it up and try and swallow it all that way without actually eating it and chewing it mm. i was watching this uh, documentary about peyote and uh, apparently uh, I forget which country it was in it might have been in Mexico or somewhere else in South America where you had to kind of have this license to grow it and use it ceremonially or for religious purposes and there was only a few people in you know the whole country who were able to do it uh, and it was a pretty big uh, business hmm. it was a, it was a, it was interesting I think it was um uh, Hamilton's uh, uh, pharmacopoeia that I was watching. It was one of those episodes where he went yeah. there and he was trying to get it and he couldn't, he couldn't find anyone who would sell it to him. Oh, that's, that's odd that he, I don't know where he went. I, I've seen his um, episode when he went to Mexico and up into the mushroom country 
And, and you know, I, I mean, his episodes were, were interesting. Uh, it was really the one he did on the mushroom country was not very good in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, and, and really the peyote users, they're in Northern Mexico. I think they're fairly accessible, but again, you know, it, it, it depends on so many different things. Mm -hmm. But uh, they're they're still there. They're still um, um, living, and a lot of them, I'm sure, doing what they've always done. But you know, it's uh, it's a different world today, and mm. it's much easier to get back into these places. I think that's a perfect segue to to get into. I guess the body of the conversation. So, for people who didn't see the first episode that we did, this is our, our guest Jeff Chilton. Uh, he is the founder of Namex, which is a mushroom uh, growing, cultivating company. Uh, I'd like to give you a chance to introduce yourself and kind of what you're about and what you do so people can better understand that. Sure, sure. Well, I went to university in the 1960s uh, at a time when there was a lot of changes and certainly was part of the counterculture. And part of that, you know, my studies at university were in uh, anthropology, social anthropology, cultures. I was really interested in other cultures. After all, it was a kind of a cultural revolution in the 60s. Mm -hmm. And also I studied mycology. And when I, um, and, and in a sense, my studies were the use of, of uh, um, mushrooms in religion and uh, also for food and medicine. But a lot of it was uh, mushrooms in um, ancient religions, because that's where you really found it. And then, of course, you know, the thing about it was that in um, 1957, uh, you know, I don't know if we talked about this for, before, but a man named R. Gordon Wasson in the 50s, he went down to southern Mexico and discovered um, or rediscovered, let's say, the fact that there were still communities down there, uh, native communities back up in the mountains that were still using mushrooms in their um, um, local medical traditions. Uh, you could call them shamans, I suppose, mm -hmm. um, which was a huge, huge, I mean, that, that was sort of like one of the first things that, that opened up the whole world to, um, the whole psycho psychoactive plants and, and once again, brought them to the forefront. And certainly that just carried right on into the sixties. And, uh, then in, and once I was out of, out of university, I went, uh, and got a job at a very large mushroom farm in Olympia, Washington, and was there for 10 years and uh, lived with mushrooms for 10 years. And then in 1989, I started my own company, Namex, which uh, introduced mushrooms to the supplement industry, which at that point in time, there were no mushrooms in the, su in the supplement space. And so I spent the whole 90s educating the supplement industry and people herbalists to the fact that mushrooms were utilized as herbal medicine for thousands of years. Um, certainly not psychoactive mushrooms that I was introducing to them, <laughs> but medicinal yeah. mushrooms. And uh, at any rate, that's sort of uh, my company sells uh, mushroom extract products to um, supplement companies. And we also have a line of uh, of uh, retail products as well. I was uh, reading through your website, the educational pieces, and I was kind of going down the rabbit hole. Uh, so I had a lot of uh, specific questions yep. uh, to ask you. The first one I'd want to start off with is what medicinal mushroom do people not know about that you wish they knew more about? You know, there's always like this fad that one mushroom comes into season and everyone wants to get it. No one really knows what it's about. What is like one of the ones that no one knows about that you think could be really big? Well, yeah, that's interesting because, you know, we have what we call in the industry, the flavor of the month. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times <laughs> some herb jumps up and all of a sudden everybody in the world wants it. And it's mm -hmm. just, a, everybody's talking about it and writing about it. I, I don't, mushrooms to some degree are like that, but I think it's, it's bigger than that right now because of the fact that there are so many different species that are being used. And we're always on the lookout for new and interesting mushroom species, especially when a body of research shows that certain mushrooms have a, activities that we're interested in but 
the key issue is always, well, if it does, is there enough of a supply mm. that it could actually be brought to the supplement industry? And, and right now, one of those uh, actually is uh, something called the cauliflower mushroom. Hmm. And I don't know if you're familiar with the cauliflower mushroom, but it is, it is a choice edible mushroom that when you see it, it, it can get very big. It can get two, three, four pounds. And it, and it's, and it's all very kind of flowery and, and beautiful. And, and it's got, when you, when you uh, cook it, it's, you kind of pull it apart because it's, it's not like a traditional mushroom at all. So it's very, very different. So when you, when you, uh, after you cook it, it, it tastes like noodles. It is just delicious that way. Mm. Um, my son actually found one this season already beautiful it's about a two pounder it's about the size of almost somebody's head it's really uh, nice but the, but there's some uh, been some research out there on this mushroom that shows it's got some some interesting um, activities uh, I don't actually remember specifically because but it was a little bit had something that caught my attention as being huh this has some possibilities and um then as I started to look for it, I discovered there were actually companies now that are growing it. Hmm. And, and, and here's what's interesting about that is that, is that um, when a new mushroom comes into cultivation, I mean, think about it for a minute. It's like uh, some plant that's never been cultivated before mm -hmm. for a certain reason. And all of a sudden somebody learns how to cultivate it. And it's like, Eureka, holy smokes. Now we, we can actually grow this. And so the fact that they can grow it is something that we're really looking at right now. And we're, we're in contact with the people who are, who are doing it and we're getting samples and we're going to see where we can go with it and, and uh, possibly introduce it by next year. So mm -hmm. that's something right now that we're kind of interested in. And, uh, you know, the other thing we're doing too is, is just um, looking at certain combinations and not necessarily of mushrooms themselves, but combinations of mushrooms with other herbal products or, or minerals. And, and uh, I think I talked to you about the fact that we'd just come out with a new product that was, uh, our mushroom extracts, reishi and chaga, and we combine those with zinc and vitamin D. Mm. And, and the interesting thing is that mushrooms contain a compound called ergosterol. That's the fungal sterol. It is similar to our cholesterol. You know, cholesterol is precursor to vitamin D3 that we manufacture. It's, it's you know, in our skin. It's, it's part of what helps, gives us uh, elasticity in our cells. So cholesterol is a very important compound for us. Well, when we expose our skin to UV light, that turns into vitamin D3 or what's called cola cola calciferol so with mushrooms their ergosterol turns into ergo calciferol mm. so uh, so essentially uh, if, if you want you can take your your fresh mushrooms slice them up expose them to sunlight and you'll you'll wow. boost up the vitamin d amount in them because mushrooms don't really have much vitamin D on their own. So is that a different kind of vitamin D then? It's Cause it's vitamin, the it's vitamin D2 huh. is what they call it. So there's D2 and D3 and, and the, the experts out there, the experts, uh, of, of vitamin D, they basically say that they act in the same way that there's no significant difference between d2 and d3 and actually looking at the history of vitamin d which is really fascinating um, back in the 1800s 
all of a sudden in England, in the cities, children started to get rickets. Mm -hmm. Well, this was the beginning of the industrial revolution. And this was at a time where all of a sudden these cities grew up and, and you've got buildings mm -hmm. that are five, six stories. And all of a sudden you're walking down streets and there's no sunlight besides the fact that now you've got a smoke right. haze Smog, clouding working out. in factories. Yeah. The whole Lack thing. So, so what happened was that they, after looking into this in a deep way, they finally figured out that it was lack of sunlight and mm. lack of vitamin D. Well, they're not going to stop the factories and they can't mm. stop the pollution because they're cranking out the coal fired power plants. Mm. So um, what they started to do then is that they, they started to fortify milk and other food products with vitamin D2 from that they would they created uh, with yeast, hmm. and and yeast has been a, a something that that we've grown for hundreds of years, and so they they knew that yeast was something that they could uh, irradiate or put out in the sun and create vitamin. So that's what they fortified the, uh, milk with was vitamin D2. So it's been in use for a long, long time. So, so one of the things that, that we are doing is we will, we've actually got a vitamin D product right now um, that we sell. And, and, you know, you've read a lot about vitamin D lately, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been big, especially with COVID. Yes. A lot of research coming out with it uh, effects on the immune system. Yes, exactly. And and you know, I've been reading about it for a number of years now because of the fact that of uh, this ergosterol in mushrooms, and I've just been so interested in just digging into it all. I mean, for some of the research. And some of the people that are really deep in the research, these uh, uh, PhD physicians and things, um, man, the number of different diseases that they talk about that are correlated to some degree with vitamin D deficiency is, is mind boggling, really. I mean, it just seems like such an important vitamin. And, you know, those of us in the northern climates who probably don't get enough, um, that's something where we should be supplementing it with it on a, on a regular basis just to make sure that we're getting enough. And this is big, this is becoming with the COVID mm -hmm. it, and, and all of the information that's come out about it shown that, that the people who are infected and the people who are having the most difficulties are people that actually have very low levels of vitamin D in their system, much lower than the people that get over it fairly quickly and, and are fine. So we've got another correlation. And, and that just means essentially, in my mind, okay, it's got these uh, powerful antiviral properties. So, so what and, and I used to take vitamin D regularly, but the fact is I don't take a lot of supplements and, and sometimes I'm taking them for a year or two and then they drop away. Mm -hmm. I, used to, I used to take zinc all the time because I, I'm a, a big fan of uh, Andrew Weil. Mm -hmm. And he's a, he's a, a, he basically says, you know, you should be taking zinc regularly. And so I was for a while, zinc and D, and then I kind of, they kind of dropped away for whatever reason. I went traveling and didn't bring them and, recently just stopped taking them. Well, recently I just thought, well, with all this new information about vitamin D and all this information about zinc, and I'm just thinking, I need to get back on that wagon. <laughs> I need to start taking vitamin D and zinc again. But I thought, why not create a product with our mushroom extracts and have all of it in one place. And, and you know, in a, in a sense, I, I have to say, I think I actually created this product for myself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so that's a new product that we have. And, 
you know, zinc is, a, is one of those minerals, one of the, if you want to supplement with any mineral, mm -hmm. zinc is really the one. Again, it's got uh, uh, benefits for our immuni immunity. It's anti-inflammatory. There, there seem to be so many benefits from zinc, and that's another one of those you know, sort of, you know, it's one again, of the tried and true ones. Uh, yeah. It's one of the few that when tested actually showed to decrease the length of colds. It's one of the few yes. of anything that has been shown to affect, you know, colds. And exactly. Other because there's lozenges out there mm -hmm. that they've done a lot of the tests with. And, and so, you know, for me, I just thought, you know, this is a perfect combination. It's a perfect marriage of three ingredients. You got mushroom extracts, you've got zinc, you've got vitamin D. And the, the thing I love about it is the vitamin D comes from a fungal source. And, and, and listen, if you, if you look at the way vitamin D3 is processed, and vitamin D3, the majority of it comes from lanolin, mm -hmm. sheep's wool. That's fine with me. It's a great, you know, they're, they're shearing all these sheep. You got lots of wool. You strip the lanolin out of it, turn it into something very good. Fabulous. I like that. But, but, but ultimately when you look at the process, it's a, it's a process where they use a lot of chemicals mm -hmm. to ultimately get it out and, and remove all the rest that's there and purify it down to the D3. This Mushroom D2 is nothing more than exposing mushroom powder to UVB light. Mm. It is so simple. I love simplicity. It doesn't matter. I, I, that's really, to me, uh, very important in life is keep things simple. Hmm. Does that mean that if you were going mushroom picking or something and you ate a mushroom that was outside somewhere in some light that it would have uh, a vitamin D in it? Or is it something that you have to, you know, chop it up and expose it? Well, you know, the, the, the basic um, process is, is you have to expose a lot of surface area. Got it. So it's probably so needs to be grinded that up. One mushroom. No, it's not going to get much vitamin D from just growing out uh, in nature at all. Uh, not much at all. Um, you know, it's just like, you know, it's just the same as, as us, we can expose a certain amount of skin, but we're only going to get whatever vitamin D from those exposed areas, not like taking you know, out at the beach and you got a bathing suit and your whole body's exposed to the light, then you're really going to get a much, much more. So, so yeah, but you know, I, 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 just love the fact i mean i mean that's the thing with this product is it's like okay we've got mushroom extracts plus mushroom vitamin d i and and look um I, i'm not telling people don't take vitamin d3 i mean sure take vitamin d3 i mean vitamin d3 is really cheap the our mushroom d is not as cheap it will become cheaper as we are expanding our production of it but it just you know to me i just thought this is just such a wonderful combination for a time when we probably all should be taking <laughs> zinc and vitamin D and and uh, so so it's a perfect product for me it's like a 2000 I use of D2 it's got 30 milligrams of zinc and, and you know the other thing about the zinc too is they actually chelate the zinc to make it more bioavailable for us mm. so it's not just kind of mineral zinc it's it's chelated and and uh, that process is like attaching it to a amino acid and somehow doing that they say and tests seem to demonstrate that it becomes uh, more bioavailable for us so uh, 30 milligrams of zinc so i'm just like this is just what I, I want. And here's the supplement that I've been waiting for. Yeah, you that know. sounds great overall for uh, for immune health. I know a lot of the, in general, the medicinal mushrooms tend to have this specific affinity towards the nervous system and the immune system. From what you understand, what is really the difference between a lot of the medicinal mushrooms, right? They say that they all have polysaccharides and they have a lot of similar compounds, but what really differentiates them in terms of, you know, this one's good for this, this one's good for that? Well, you know, that's not an easy question 
um, the the where where most of those differentiations come in is when you look at the all of the research data or um, you know you know immune system tests. I mean, what they do for the most part to sort of demonstrate all this is anti-tumor studies. And whether that's in vitro or in vivo, and a lot of it's in vivo where they do mouse studies. And, and what they do is they test them against different tumor systems. So ultimately you could say that, oh, it is good for um, um, breast or it's good for liver or, you, you could say that according to some of the testing data. But beyond that, I, I'm not so sure that we can differentiate too much. Um, so, so for me, that's why, that's why I'm always thinking, look, you know, I, I have a book that is called The Icons of Medicinal Mushrooms. It's a book out of China. It's in English, but it lists 272 different mushroom species that it says have medicinal value. Well, think about that for a minute. 270 species? Where does one begin? <laughs> well, uh, I mean, there's a number of places where we begin. Certainly, we begin by traditional use. Which ones of these are actually being used? Because those 272, the reason they're listed is because somebody has done some research with that particular mushroom and demonstrated benefits against whether it be, uh, you know, tumors or, or some other type of test. So they list it in that book. Um, but you know, let's face it, some of these have got more data behind them. Some of these have been utilized for um, thousands of years, hundreds of years. So those are the ones that, for me, I look at and say, well, these are the ones we really want to focus on. You know, it's kind of like if somebody said, well, let's, let's put together a mushroom product and let's put 20 different species into that. And, and because we've got all these different ones that have medicinal properties, let's just throw them all together and, and that's going to be better, right? Well, no, it's not going to be better. It's probably going to be worse <laughs> because you are diluting the benefits from the, the major ones that all of the research is based around. And there's probably about six different species that I would call sort of our major grouping of medicinal species and you know which is not to say that some of the other mushrooms don't have other benefits like for example tremella and um auricularia which is the wood ear you ever seen auricularia out in the wild i've not no it does kind of look like an ear it's kind of rubbery mm. <laughs> it's it's kind of flat and rubbery and you can pull it off and you can almost go yeah it looks like an ear to me too <laughs> um those two mushrooms seem to have very positive benefits for the skin. And they are, their flesh is very rubbery, in some cases, almost gelatinous. They've got a texture that's chewy. Uh, in China, both of them are edible species. Um, over here, would they fly? Well, maybe not, you know. People, when it gets too chewy, they're kind of like, eh, I don't want to chew so much to eat whatever that is, right? Mm -hmm. um, unless you could chop it up really finely or something. So so those two mushrooms, you can say, oh, wow, okay, we've got some mushrooms that goes beyond just the whole immunological issue. Uh, I mean, the other one that does that, of course, is, is lion's mane, where we do have this data that demonstrates that it's got benefits uh, in terms of stimulating the production of nerve growth factor and, and nerve growth factor as we get older we tend to produce less of it and it's pretty important for the organization and maintenance of neurons uh you know it's like i don't want to lose any more neurons come on <laughs> right produce more <laughs> and they so, don't come back so easy right no there's no, neuroplasticity we're finding now but still it's not as much you know, it's not the same thing as getting a cut, you know, if you, 
if you mess yeah. up your brain, that's kind of it. Yeah, <laughs> that's less. right. Well, well, look, if if you've ever known anybody with early onset dementia or something, mm -hmm. it is pretty stark and startling to to witness that. Now, now, my mother is 95 years old. She actually is still pretty sharp. But you know, don't ask her about too many things that happened 50 years ago or 60 years ago. Her memory now is, is much better in just recent within this last week. So is mine within this last week. But I mean, I can sit down and think about things. Oh yeah, I remember the 50s, I did this, I did that, or 60s, I did this or did that. But you know, try to reconstruct a single day in your life 10, 15 years ago. And okay, let's see, what did I do on my, my 10th birthday? I mean, who, who came to the party? Uh, well, what did we I have do no idea? Well, yeah, <laughs> I mean, I mean, you know, you know, it's like, we have so much information jam packed into our brain and, and it's there somewhere, but trying to actually retrieve it. I mean, what we tend to, to have that comes back are those moments that really were somehow important in some way, mm -hmm. whether in a negative or a positive way, because it could be both that we really remember those, those events. But um, so anyway, uh, lion's mane is, is interesting that way. And, and, you know, I think, I think as we move forward, we will find that um, and especially as practitioners like yourself, uh, utilize mushrooms because you know so much of 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 um, supplementation, especially when it comes to herbal products, it takes herbalists, clinical herbalists. It takes naturopaths to be utilizing these and coming back and saying, "Hey, I've been using it for this and that, and it seems to work," and and things like that. All, all that uh, builds up a body of data that helps to to validate the activities of some of these herbs. Mm, and that's, that's a pretty common experience that something in the research will be shown to work, but then clinically it's like, eh, it doesn't really work for most people or something is not shown to work, but it has good traditional use. And it's like miraculous when used clinically. So there's, there's a lot going on. It's, it's hard yeah. to know what is well. What. And the other part of that too, that I really want to stress is that sometimes what happens, especially for companies that are marketing products is let's just say there's a, there's, there's a tremendous body of research, for example, on reishi mushroom. Mm -hmm. and, and if you, if you collate it all, you could say, wow, these researchers have shown that it's got benefits, uh, got 30 different benefits. And then, and, and you know, like, like, for example, there's some that, that would say, oh, yeah, they've, they've tested it against the HIV virus. And, and in this particular extract or whatever, it seems to show some benefits. Next thing you know, uh, uh, companies is out there saying, yeah, it's, it's uh, good for HIV. <laughs> it's like, you have to yeah. be very careful about looking at the research and then making claims on what it can do you, you really want mm -hmm. you know it's like i don't know if you've looked on the internet at, at a company selling chaga i've heard a lot about that lately that's been one of those like fad type of mushrooms oh lord it is just horrible <laughs> <laughs> i mean it is awful it's the king of mushrooms it, it's a panacea that does a hundred different things it's like get your chaga now before it's too late it is it is just the classic example of marketing gone crazy mm -hmm. and and that that at times too whenever something is is considered a panacea i just look at it and i'm like you know what this is so not helpful <laughs> yeah well, let's just bring <laughs> it down and focus on uh, two or three of the really important illnesses or conditions where there's enough research to demonstrate that, yeah, there are some real benefits here. Let's use it. Let's try it out. But don't give me something that's got 20 to 100 different things that you're claiming it will do. That is just uh, pure marketing and, and what I 
call marketing speak because it's just like, you know, <laughs> it's like, no, I don't want to hear about it. You know, I, I tell people at times, look, Chaga is the, I believe the fourth king of mushrooms that I've been aware of in the last 30 years. I mean, the king comes and goes. One gets deposed and a new one takes <laughs> place. Right. You know, it's like, it's like, you know, it, it's gotten so bad that a few people have said, oh, yeah, you know, Chaga's the king and Ray, she's the queen. I'm like, what? Yeah, like, they're just what, what are you stuff. talking about? This is, this is pure, you know, like, uh, marketing. And no, there's no Reishi the queen. There's no Chaga the king. That's just all somebody trying to sell you a, mm -hmm. a product. It's, it's an interesting situation in, in medicine in general that's happening with marketing, especially with the fact that, you know, pharmaceuticals can be advertised on TV. And it's also similarly happening, as you're mentioning, in the more alternative health supplement industry where people are just hearing something and they're looking for it. I was working in an herb shop for uh, a while back, like a year ago. And I remember just working there and someone came in and they're like, hey, do you guys have chaga? And me, you know, being a naturopath, I'm like, oh, well, what do you want to use it for? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And they don't really even know. <laughs> it's like, I don't know, but I want it. Oh, okay, I, well, that's well, not really medicine. That's exactly. a little bit something different. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they've listened to it. They've heard it and they get excited and they go, oh, my God. Yeah. This stuff must be fantastic. Which I has like a good it... aspect to it. It's good that people are like so fired up about these things that, you know, until recently have been you know, woo woo type of things, but yeah. it's also not good for people to just, you know, blindly follow the herb of the week. Well, yeah. And, and this gets back to, to this whole idea too, of snake oil and mm -hmm. snake oil salesmen. And with all due respect to snake oil, which the real thing was probably pretty good for something. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> but but you know it got caught up in in you know you can just think of this guy with his uh uh medicine wagon that he's pulling from town to town and on the back of it he's standing there talking about his wonderful elixir that he's got and and just telling of all the wonderful benefits and people lining up oh i want some i want some i want some and then he leaves town quickly and keeps moving and that's kind of the thing too is some of these people it's just like they just keep moving they say things but you can't you know sort of like pin them down mm -hmm. because they're moving so fast and they're saying all sorts of new things and that's also where you just have to be so careful about gurus and experts and all of these types of people mm -hmm. and go okay well i heard this let me talk to other people let me check and find out whether this is just another salesman or what they're saying is genuine. Mm. I had a, a wonderful uh, herbalist teacher that uh, said there's three general rules of knowing and understanding if a herb is worthwhile or a mushroom is worthwhile for usage. One is look at its traditional uses. Has it been used for thousands of years? Has it been cultivated? probably for a reason. People aren't stupid. They will grow things that help them, obviously. Yes, yes. Two is research. Has it been researched? Is the research actually good? Is it just research by a supplement company that wants to sell their product? If it has good research, then okay, that's good. And then three, and not to be forgotten, the third one is uh, anecdotal and experience-based. You know, do you have a friend that used it? Is this doctor who used it on 100 patients telling you that it's really useful? Uh, did you use it and you noticed it? Maybe there's no research about it, but whenever you drink chamomile tea, you know, your skin feels better. Who knows? It's hard you know to what? say whether it does that or not. I totally agree with that. And the first two are the primary things that I use to, to decide whether a certain mushroom species is something that we want to develop and sell. Um, those are so important. And then being in the industry, I know so many herbalists, uh, my generation herbalists that have been around for a long time, and I really 
listen to what they have to say because a, a clinical herbalist, as you know, I mean, they're right there and they're prescribing certain things. They're working with people who, you know, I, I mean, it's really interesting the information that comes back from that. And so that's absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. Especially when they work from within some kind of tradition or system that goes beyond uh, the very commonly simplistic methodology that's used. You know, this herb is good for anxiety. This one's good for sleep. This one's good for that. And it's like, if you actually delve into herbalism, you'll see that that's very, very surface level that, you know, if, there might be 20 herbs that are used for sleep, but who's the person in front of you? Do they have this and that symptom? Are they showing this and that constitution? Uh, and all these other factors you have to consider to actually really select which is the best herb, not just what is a herb that they could use, but what is the herb that they should use? Well, yes. And, and you know, what you're really talking about is just a holistic approach, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and that's the, the issue that we all have with modern medicine. You go in there, they look at you, they ask a few questions, and then they write a prescription and say, here you go. And, and they don't, you know, it's kind of like when you were saying earlier about the companies that are selling all these, these pharmaceuticals on TV, I'm always just amazed that anybody would buy them because, you know, of course, at the end of it, they, for about 30 <laughs> seconds, they talk about all of the, yeah. <laughs> the contraindications. They talk about all the side effects and you're just like, who would want to take that with all of these yeah. side effects? I'm just, you know, but it, it must just go right out the window because they must have figured out that, oh yeah, people don't bother listening to that. All they're doing is looking at the wonderful <laughs> images and the fact that, that, you know, he, somebody's been healed or now somebody's smiling and happy. Yeah, yeah. Some of them are actually quite, quite comical. I remember one that was for something relatively, it was for some condition that's not that harmful. It was, you know, just a condition that kind of bothers people. But one of the side effects, I think was something like sudden death or something like that. And I was just like, is that a real side effect? I'm like, yeah, you know, Oh, like your digestion will be better, but you might die from it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's like, I don't know, like, yeah. where's the balance in that? Yeah, well, I think I'll chance it. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a, there's a key aspect here that I was thinking about while we were talking about how marketing in general works. And I think, so marketing is a lot, they teach that you're trying to sell somebody a feeling or an emotion or a state of being or something new, right? Yeah supplements and medicines and herbs and all that, they naturally do that. They don't have to be, cause you know, you know, every marketing company, no matter what they're selling now, you know, Coca-Cola, like it shows like with family and like love and, you know, they have to like take jumps to kind of bring in some emotionality or something, or they're selling, you know, screwdrivers and it's like, yeah, strong, hearty man, like yeah, be the yeah, man yeah, of your yeah, family. Yeah, like, yeah. but but medicines and herbs, like if a herb is good for your mental well-being, like it actually is good for your mental well-being. It's not like something that has to be like it it already markets itself in in to some degree. So yeah, my point there is that like it's very easy to um for that to be corrupted because of their natural value and people going overboard and saying this helps for that, this, that, and this, they'll make you feel like this. That well, and, and, you know, part of what you're saying, too, is like, for example, if you look at beer commercials, what are you actually seeing? You're just seeing happy people at a party, you know, having a great time. And you're just thinking, wow, it, yeah, I'll, I'll bring that beer <laughs> next time I have a party. That's what I want to drink, because look at these people. Um, I've got actually a catalog from a company that um, sells medicinal mushroom products, and it's a really beautifully done catalog. And every single page has got beautiful people with smiling faces with perfect teeth and mm -hmm. all the rest <laughs> and and I, I look at that and i'm just like yeah th this th wonderful wonderful catalog if i'm looking through this i'm i'm impressed i'm i'm thinking look at those smiling people who must be using these products mm. and the issue too is that a lot of these uh 
commercials, advertising, it works on a subconscious level. It's like you can consciously, you know, think that it's ridiculous that they're trying to sell you on that. But if you're in another country and there's a bunch of uh, so, uh, sodas and there happens to be Coca-Cola, you're probably going to get the Coca-Cola, like even though you think that it doesn't influence you, but it does because it it has like a kind of brand and it has a feel that it builds up over time. And Oh, that's absolutely and- right. And the, the unconsciousness of that, it's, it's almost like any information that we get. If we're, you know, for example, if people are watching the six o'clock news and, and, you know, it's like, I don't know if anybody under the age of 40 watches the six o'clock news, but a I lot of people hope in my, <laughs> it's certainly a lot of people in my generation still do. And I'm always shocked. I'm like, what are you watching that for? Mm-hmm. And, and, and these people, I, I know it because a lot of these people are my friends and I talk to them and they, they are ultimately just repeating what they've got from that sometimes i think they're not even aware of the fact that they've just been like it's kind of like they've been pumped full of information and then they just push it right back out there without even thinking about okay now you know did i is this what is this correct should Mm -hmm. i maybe look and see because i'm not sure but you know, again, a lot of times with that six o'clock news, what happens is that the the news reader um, becomes a personality, mm-hmm. and ultimately people trust that person mm. to bring them the news. Just like just like a newspaper, if you're reading a newspaper and you've done it all your life, and you're like, I've done it all my life, and I've it's always been good, and and yet you don't even realize that it's bringing you uh, information that may be nothing more than propaganda, but it's just going in and you're just, you know, then pushing it back out there. Mm. Especially what we were talking about of the memory and the impressions that are left by good and bad news in general uh, tends to go for the negative uh, impressions because they sell really well and they conflict conflict sticks in your minds when something's yes, really oh, negative does. information it you're going to remember it better but do you want to remember that like do you well, want to remember that everything's in chaos because that's yes, just a perspective that's such a good point and and again it's it's like the headline the headline is there to catch your attention and get you to remember that and the point that i always say to some of my friends i say stop watching because it's just filling you with bad information that you're bringing in and and you know it's difficult after you watch that you know it's almost like watching you know it's like with movies there are certain movies certain categories of movies that i do not watch um prison films i don't want to watch a prison shawshank redemption well okay there's (laughs) one out of hundreds right and and Look, the other my sons love that movie. I saw it. It's a, it's a really <laughs> great movie. But prison films, no. I don't want to have that in my mind about, mm-hmm. you know, all of that. Or, you know, and, and which is not to say I don't like a good thriller or the occasional shoot 'em up or something. But some directors basically make films that I consider to be way too uh, violent and, and gory that, you know, gratuitously to where mm-hmm. I, I avoid those too, because I'm just like, look, I don't want that in my head. I don't want to have that somewhere lurking around. I just mm-hmm. don't, don't, I don't want those images. I don't want anything about it. So I think that's really important. And, and we can use that uh, in whatever we do in our life. It's like, hey, um, there are certain uh, images, there's certain places, there's certain whatever, whether it's a place you go or, or, you know, what you do that, do you really want to be there Mm -hmm. soaking that up and being a part of it and then having it a part of you? Mm, I'm like that with, uh, horror movies in general i never really liked them didn't like watching them <laughs> well, didn't understand a, why people would like them that's a great just point. make me feel negative like that's a great point, point. Like, well it's funny because people like to be scared mm, that's weird <laughs> it's why it's why they have amusement parks though that's why people go on roller coasters that's yeah why people yeah. go on those There's rides where you're it. like ah you know it's like yeah. you're 
it, it gives you that kind of adrenaline rush. It's just kind of like the adrenaline rush you get when somebody startles you and you're like, Oh my yeah. God. And then you go, and you know, <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so there are people that enjoy that to a, a greater degree than others. And, yeah. and uh, I know lots of people, no, they don't want to see horror movies. No, my God. No. Then, then they'd be like, yeah, you know, women, I think, especially because then it's like, I can't sleep tonight. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, I understand. It's like, uh, that's why there's certain movies that I would never watch before going to bed. <laughs> like the shining. <laughs> and that that's, especially those like deep, not even those those movies that are like very gory, you know, Jason's going to come stab you, but more yeah. like psychological horror ones, yeah, yeah. like the shining type stuff like yeah. that stuff will keep you up and really mess with you <laughs> because like you're not even exactly sure what you're afraid of. I know, and especially when, when you go out in the hallway and down at the end of the hall, you see a oh, couple yeah. of twin girls. Down yeah, you're there just something. like just walk the other way. <laughs> You know, we're very imp impressionable, especially uh, that our conscious mind is only a small percentage of our experience that our mind is taking in, taking in, taking in. So the only choice we have isn't whether or not to take in, it's what we take in. Yeah. There's this experience I've been having uh, a lot of times in clinic, which was really comical, actually. So I live in Portland, yeah, Portland, Oregon, and I was in clinic, you know, s this must have happened at least five or six times. You know, someone will come in, I'd be like, hey, how are you doing? And there'd be something like, oh, not good. You know, the political situation or something like that. And I'm like, what political situation? Like, is the political situation here like directly impacting <laughs> your day right now? And I good heard it again and again and again. Good answer. Just, yeah. But it's like, I, uh, I can kind of understand how that would be. Like, if I watch the news all the time, and I got worked up and then I talked to everyone about it and kept like, then, you know, I would feel bad about what was happening, but it's like, that's your choice. Like you can, you feeling bad is not going to change anything, first of all. And, you know, if you did want to change something like being in a negative mood probably wouldn't even help change it in a positive way anyway. So it's like, or you can just be like me and just disconnect from the news and just live your life. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, now, having said that, it's a little bit different if you're walking down the street and every day you see, you know, maybe the results from the night before or something like that, right? Or, mm -hmm. or shops yeah. that have been, you know, broken windows and all that kind of stuff. So if you're faced with that day in day out, it's like living in a war zone. Like, I mean, mm -hmm. can you imagine people that are living in a real war zone? What that must yeah. be like? All the yeah. destruction around them. It's got to yeah, be a really stressful and traumatic. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, let's face it, everybody has their different threshold of what affects them. Uh, and, and some people are certainly more sensitive than others. And so there's, there's that as well. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, yeah, it's been, uh, it's been pretty, I remember when the rides first started, it was pretty scary times. The first time I ever had like a curfew, like it, the phone was just buzzing curfew. Um, yeah, that I understand the story. I, I shared was like a couple of years ago. So it was like, there was really not much going on. It was just kind of average stuff. Now, if someone came in and they were like, you know, the political situation, I'd be like, okay, I understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, back then sure. it was like, so there's, there's levels to it. But then like the media makes a bad thing worse, right? Like it makes a fearful thing even more fearful. It makes absolutely it more chaotic. No, that that sells. It actually sells. It keeps keeps people glued to what's going on, and 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 yeah, that that's unfortunately uh, why you know. And I guess social media hasn't really helped either. Oh, no, um, you know, it seems like it's in a way it's just made it worse. And and that's one of the things for me is I don't take part in social media. I don't have a I don't have a Facebook account. I don't have a Twitter account. I don't have an Instagram account. I don't follow any of that stuff. It's like, I don't have time for that. And, and besides, so much of it is just people spouting off or, or people, you know, like on Instagram, showing the same stupid photos over and over and over again. It's like, you know, and, and how, many, how many people, I mean, how many Instagram accounts can a person actually follow and still have time to live for goodness sake <laughs> yeah exactly. i mean you know what i mean it's just like who has time for all of this well a lot of people obviously because i see them walking down the street and they're just like in that little device mm -hmm. and that's where their life seems to be focused and and it's you know actually, it's scary i was watching a i was watching a documentary it's called the social dilemma 
if you're interested at all in like the deeper, darker aspects of social media, it's a great, great watch. I'll, I'll, I'll look for it. Yeah. Uh, it's on, it's on Netflix, but a few things from it, that was true information really startled me. Uh, one of them is that the way that the algorithms work in general allow for things be, allow for false information to become incredibly prominent um, and on everyone's news feed just because of so if people like are scrolling through and they stop on something or they click a lot or they like it or they share it the algorithm automatically puts it up higher in people's feeds there wow. this is a completely uncontrolled process so there was there was times when completely ridiculous things like I think one of the cases the movie was talking about was Pizzagate and all those conspiracies right, right, of the yeah, pedophile yeah, rings. Right. Yep. That blew up and became viral because of the algorithms, not because... So people who weren't even interested in that kind of stuff were being shown this because it became such a high uh, like algorithm that yep. everyone was being shown it. So that's one startling thing, which yep. is literally the algorithms decide what people see. So this is like media propaganda that's untethered. It's just what's what is the most effect on the limbic system that's what yes. we transmit it to everybody which yes is self-perpetuating oh man yeah Scary. yeah well and, and you know it's interesting too because it's like okay if you're if you're with your browser if you're out there and you're you know looking at this and looking at that and going to this site and that site and then then pretty soon you start to realize why why am i getting these same things coming up high higher in my when i'm doing these searches and like youtube or something and all the things along the right side are sort of giving you similar to what you've been searching for for quite a while and it's like okay I, i'm not really loop. asking for that but they've got me and they know what i've been looking for and so they're just feeding me more of it to see if they can't just draw me into even more that's another a scary thing with with instagram and facebook and and youtube is that like the algorithm kind of works uh, for instagram for example i don't know if you've used instagram but you kind of like scroll down and you can like stop over a photo and things like that it will, it tracks everything. It tracks. Wow. Did, did you stop for, for three seconds or four seconds or one wow. second? Did you click it? Did you go back to it? It tracks everything. And then wow. it specially curates your feed, not based on who you're friends with, not based on necessarily who you engage with most, but based on those things. Oh, well, and the wow. whole purpose of the algorithm is how do we keep you coming back and back and back and feeding on this <laughs> dopamine train? And that's why, um, uh, I mean, if you have a certain political belief and you stop over certain kind of posts, you'll just keep getting more and more and more and more. Of and it'll just draw you right in and you'll get deeper into it and more convinced that what you're thinking of is, yeah, this is this is right. And I, everybody else is thinking the same way or. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And yeah, the well, algorithm that's... is amoral, too. It's not like it doesn't care about like what's true or good or bad. It just cares about how do we like make people use the product more. So we can exactly. sell them advertising, exactly. which is the reason, the whole reason the social media exists now is for advertising. Yeah. And, 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 you know, it's funny because I've got an ad blocker that I use and, and I found mm. now that uh, a lot of times when I, when I go to YouTube, it's, it just gives me, oh, oh, sorry, we can't access that right now. I turn the ad blocker off and, oh yeah, there it is. There's some websites that, oh, I, oh, for the first time I've ever seen that maybe in the last year or two, there was websites where you would try to read the article and it'd say, Oh, it looks like you have ad blocker on. Sorry. We can't let you read it unless you turn it off. And it's like, they're actually countering people who don't want to be advertised. That's to. absolutely right. There's, <laughs> I'm seeing a lot of that now. Um, but, but that's okay. You know, you know, for me, when I see that, you know, if it's a, if it's a video that I want to see, uh, I, I will turn off the ad blocker just for that and then turn it back on. Normally, if it's a, something that I want to read from some new site or something, I'll just say, okay, well, the hell with you. I'm going to go somewhere else. Yeah, that's what I usually do too. You know, but but yeah, and and look, I I just think that it's, well, for one, it's very addictive, these little these little smartphones, very addictive. And, and people, I, I kind of look at it and I say, this is, this looks to me like the zombie apocalypse. You know, it's like people walking around just lost in this thing. And you go mm. onto the, the subways in certain places, everybody's there like that. Um, I see people getting out of their car. They've just been driving somewhere. They get out of their car, 
what's the first thing they do? Or sometimes they don't even get out. They'll sit there and they'll get their phone out and they'll start to look at it, right? Because, oh yeah, it's been 15 minutes since I've checked out this or that on my phone. And so that's right away what they go to. Yeah, we're, uh, we're really becoming symbiotic with this technology. It's we becoming are. like another limb, you know, you forget your phone and like, you just are anxious. Like you just, you feel like you forgot your leg at home or something. <laughs> I've, I, I've got a friend that is constantly, you know, it used to be he'd lose his keys all the time. And usually it's just, he misplaced them. Mm-hmm. And, and now it's his phone. He's constantly putting it down somewhere. And then <laughs> where's my phone and, Yeah, and, and trying to backtrack to find out where it is. And, oh yeah, it, it ended up, it's just in the bathroom and something like that. Right. It's just like, it's, it's, it's gotten to be that way. And, and it's unfortunate. And that's one of the reasons I do not have a smartphone. I don't use a smartphone. I've gotten actually a beautiful little flip phone. And, and all I use it for is making calls. That's all, all, all I need wow. it for. I mean, I mean, look, everybody's life is on their smartphone. Phone, so nobody wants to give it up because there's too many things. And ultimately, it's going to a place where, where um, we're going to go cashless probably within the next 10 years. Mm-hmm. Um, in China, they're already pretty much cashless. Everybody just uses their phone. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm, I'm, it's the same in some other countries. I think Sweden is close to that now. And, and my sons, which are probably your age or uh, thereabouts, they don't use cash. I mean, everything they put on their mm-hmm. cards, um, you know, for me, I, I prefer to use cash and especially too, smaller yeah. transactions and things like that. I mean, so I'm always carrying cash around and doing that. And, and I don't use my card unless it's really kind of a, a bigger purchase mm. of some sort, you know, hundreds of dollars or something like that. But mm. otherwise, no, I, and I'm, I'm the last thing I want is for it to go to a place where, you know, cash is gone. Everything's on your card, your phone, your whatever it is. Mm. You're, nobody, you're not going to be able to travel in five years without a phone because mm. they're going to have health information on there, which is basically, you know, you can't pass this border unless you show us yep. their, your health certificates. They're, and- they're already, they're already starting to do stuff like that. I went to uh, Aruba to vacation and it was, I had to get like COVID testing before I went there. I had to show them I had COVID insurance and it was all over my phone. Like it's already, it's already happening. Yes, exactly. It is already happening and it's just going to continue to go down that in, in China. They, on your phone, you'll have something that is um, uh, basically for your health thing. It'll be either green, yellow, or red. Red means forget it. You're not passing this point. Mm. Yellow is one of those. Okay. They'll decide whether they mm. let you in based on certain things. And green is like, okay, yeah carry on i think the powers that be finally woke up and realized that to control the people in this day you need to control the internet social media phones that's like the new mode of control it's not like it was before no that's absolutely right starting to wake up to that and i i even see all sorts of strange stuff on facebook and instagram that bothers me that you know it seems kind of you know, like it's not that big of an issue. Like when you're on Instagram and on top of the page, it says, please like register for the census or like on Facebook on the top of the page says register to vote. And it's like, when did like social media become like the PR department for the government? <laughs> like I, that happened in the last year, maybe wow. in the last few months, I'd never seen anything like that. And you know, people could say, Oh, that's ridiculous. You're overblowing it. Like it's just the census and the vote. It's like, but like, that's intrusive. Like, are they paying for that advertising? Like, and it's not even advertising. It's like, you know, on the home page. it's not like one of those ads. It's like embedded in the software. It's like, well, the social media companies are very close to the government and getting closer all the time. So it's not, uh, you know, it, you know, Google has been sort of financed by the government from way back and they've got, you know, I mean, it's just like any of those really high tech companies that are very important in our lives. I mean, the government's going to go to them and say, Hey, look, we need to access your data from time to time. They can, they can access all of it. Of course. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, we learned so that from Snowden. here. Yeah. And sign here. Um, uh, if you don't, well, you know, all those wonderful government contracts that you're getting and all the money you're making from the government gone. So of course they're going to sign there and of course they're Mm. going to cooperate in every way possible. And that's just basically part of that Mm. infrastructure that's out there now, the electronic 
infrastructure. And yes, Snowden laid it all out. And, you know, it's just so funny to hear those uh, top spooks uh, uh, go before Congress and just lie like crazy. Say, oh, no, we don't spy on Americans. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> what else would they do? So now that we kind of brought this situation to light, what do you what do you think personally is the way forward through all of this? Because like this stuff, like technology is just going to keep getting more advanced, going to get more integrated. There's going to be more influence from social media. What's the way forward? Is there really nothing we can do? What do you think? Well, you know what? I, I mean, the fact is, is there, there's not a lot we can do because we're all dependent on the internet. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, they can wall it off and keep us in a, in an enclosed community. I mean, when I travel now, I use a VPN because when I go to China, China has already got a wall, a firewall. So, you know, if you're, if you're using uh, a Google drive or something like that, and that's where your company information is, you can't access it unless you activate your, your VPN and then you can do it. Wow. If you, if you use Gmail, you, it will not work. Uh, Google searches will not work. So you have to use the VPN. And, and is that going to be enough in the future? Are, are, you know, is the government going to find out ways to Stop shut that, down yeah. the VPNs or whatever? But I mean, um, even the way the world is working right now, we're, we're with all of the, the um, let's say, now that Russia and China are on the enemies list in a big way and, and they're coming together and they're, they're just going, look, we can, we can see this right mm -hmm. now. Um, we have to be self-sufficient and not depend on all of those things that have been set up by the U S for example. Um, it's the, uh, if you're moving money around, like if you're buying like we, we purchase a lot of our products. I mean, obviously we're purchasing our products in China. So we're transferring money back and forth over a system set up by the, and controlled by the United States. They can cut anybody off from that system. And, and so you can, if your business is dependent on it, you, you can be in trouble. So there's mm -hmm. other systems. So we're going we're gonna to see things break into different sectors in the world that will have their own internets that will mm. have their own ways to transfer and do business. Mm -hmm. This is, this is where we're moving right now. And, mm. and a lot of it in a way is just the fact that the U S empire is starting, you know, it, it's, it's like they, they control the dollar is the medium of, of trade. And that's starting to be under pressure too. companies now are going, our countries are going, we're going to trade in our own currencies. We're going to mm -hmm. bypass the dollar because that that affects us and and in a negative way when when they're sanctioning everybody so that that and i i don't know how we're going to get around it all because right now what i'm looking at is if i want to travel how many countries are actually open and when they do open what am i going to have to have like you said you went to aruba what what am i going to have to have to be able to travel well probably a, a covid 19 test that says okay but how how good is that because uh if that's for a certain date, how long is that good for? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, that, that was taken a month ago. No, it has to be within a week before you come. You know what I mean? It's so, it was, and, it was like that. Yeah. It was a week before you come. Yeah. And, and then it's like, oh, well, okay. But uh, maybe it's got to be done right at the airport before you fly. And we're going to have tests that will tell us within 15 minutes before you even come in, you're going to have to do this, wait over there. And if it's a green, okay, go ahead. If it's not, Sorry. They had those had those two. They had testing at the airport and also at the arriving airport. So this is yes, it's it's startling. Especially I'm especially worried about what's going to happen um, when the vaccine comes out and how safe it'll be. I don't know if it'll be safe or not. It's hard to say, uh, but it probably will be mandated. If not just outright, it's going to be mandated in the same kind of way of oh, sorry, you can't travel without it, which is basically mandated. If you need to travel, you can't okay, you just can't do business anymore then. Yeah, well, that's right. Yeah, you, and you can't fly here, you can't fly there because if you, you have to be vaccinated. And look, um, vaccines take time to develop. Mm -hmm. they, they, you don't develop them over. I just heard Bill Gates talking in an article today and he said, well, you know, actually it, it won't be the, the first vaccine because we're, that's probably not going to be enough and, and we won't really get back to normal until the second vaccine and we have the second vaccination. 
And I'm just thinking there, you know, to me, it's almost like, look, we didn't get this far living in a bubble. Um, is this really as bad as they say it is or, or not? I, I'm, I'm, you know, I don't know anybody that's had it actually. So maybe that's, maybe I'm somebody special, but I've talked to friends and very few people know very many people. And, and uh, my mother's 95, she's still alive. She's in an assisted care home. Um, I just think that, you know, these kind of things, they're always used by the government as mm -hmm. another means of control. And that's, that's really the issue. And not only that, I don't want to be vaccinated with something that's not tested and true and not something that, okay, I've got to do this every, you know, year or something like that. Look, I feel very healthy. I'm, I'm willing to take my risks. Um, mm. I, I'm not going to live in a bubble. Absolutely mm. not. I mean, that's not how we developed as a, a species. I mean, we developed immunity to all sorts of things out there, including viruses. So yeah, look. yeah, I, I think there's nothing necessarily wrong with the vaccine. But what is wrong with it is, is if and when it comes out to force it upon people. I think that that's, that's unethical, regardless. I mean, if this was something different, like if this was like the bubonic plague and it had 50% mortality yes, and yes, people yes. were like, well, I still want to decide for myself. I'd be like, okay, <laughs> shut up. No, like you can't decide for yourself at that point, but it's not anything close to that. So no. like, that's not even the conversation. That's right. That's absolutely right. And, and I think people have to, to realize that because right now, how many people are dying that have been uh, quarantined, uh, who've lost their jobs, they, they're at home, they've got no money. Um, they're wondering about paying the rent. They're sort of like, okay, we've got a more, don't worry, we've got a moratorium on the rent for three months or four months. But after that, now you have four months of back rent to have to pay. Yeah. I, I mean, you <laughs> know, no thank job. you. Uh, you know, yeah, and no job. So it's like the damage being done to people's lives, all the people that couldn't get in and have, have normal uh, health care for whatever it is that they, they needed it for. All of those people know it's it's uh, been uh, I think it's been really pretty messy and we're always hearing something that's counter to what they told us a couple of months ago. Mm -hmm. and, and that, unfortunately, that's is a, a big issue for me is that and, and I just think, look, OK, we're learning things. And so so we can't really say when somebody comes out and makes a pronouncement, we can't say, oh, yeah, that's absolutely it. No, because months later, it turns out that's totally wrong. Mm hmm. And here we are here in October, here in Portland, we're still only in stage one reopening. Wow. Is that right? My community is yeah. completely open, but I live in a smaller community, but in, in BC, it's been, you know, Vancouver. I was in Vancouver not long ago. It's normal. I mean, obviously in some cases you go into certain stores and they're like, okay, only X number of people at a time, or, or maybe here's some hand sanitizer, or maybe you, you need a mask to come in, something like that. But generally speaking, life is, was fairly normal in Vancouver and it's totally normal in my community other than, okay, I have to wear a mask when I go to my supermarket. But other than that, mm -hmm. it's just, you know, and, and most people are not wearing masks when they're walking around at all. There's none of that. I mean, do, I don't know if you remember when, when some, I don't know what it was, came out and said, so, okay, uh, I want you people, when you're on your Zoom calls, I want you to be wearing a mask. <laughs> <laughs> Who the hell said that? <laughs> it, well, and, and the, the idea was, look, you have to do this in solidarity. Oh, my God. That's all it is. You know, and, and some places where it's like, okay, uh, look, if you're at home and with your family and if there's more than X number of you, you'd better mask up. That's so ridiculous. Like, you know, well, well, it is ridiculous. And, and I think the damage that's being done to people right now, especially small business owners, mm -hmm. they are just being hung out to dry. So many, yeah. I remember I, I went back home to New York, kind of like my hometown where I grew up most of my life. And, you know, a lot of the same places that I saw just last year were all closed or is a different store. Like, I, like stores that have been there for like 10 years, just now they're not there or different place within a few months. Horrible. So, just yeah. horrible. Speaking of New York, 
when I Google up your name, up comes this surgeon. Yeah, that's my dad. Yeah, I was going, look, there can't be that many people with this name out. Yeah, there. <laughs> yeah, that's that's my dad. I'm the I'm the naturopathic doctor. He's the uh, he's the surgeon. Oh, wow. So that's got to be interesting conversational. Yeah. Yeah. You know, surprisingly, uh, at, at first, my parents were kind of iffy about me doing the naturopathic, but I think uh, they kind of warmed up to it and supported it because uh, being from Ukraine, we really do have more of like a like folk herbalism is kind of even a part of the conventional medicine there. So it's not yeah. that aspect that they didn't like. It was more of like job security, that kind of thing that they were worried about, <laughs> which is job reasonable. Security. Well, you know what? Look, I mean, in naturopathic school, you guys are doing a heck of a lot of physiology. Come yeah. on. It's yeah. like, so you're, you're understanding the human body pretty well. Yeah, I think it's, uh, we learned most of the same things that uh, MDs and DOs learn. We just kind of added on to that as like the herbs. And of course, we don't go into as much intense detail and in things like pharmacology, but we do learn it. And I took a board exam on pharmacology. So yeah. we do, we do learn those things. I think yeah. it's useful actually to, to know everything you can. Sure. Sure. I mean, you know what, let's face it. It's, it's not something that uh, your education stops when you graduate. I mean, yeah. there's so much to be continuing to learn and new information and just, just more information that's there that you haven't gotten to. Yeah. And uh, healing and medicine is just such a mystery. Even, even in today's time when we think we have the answers for everything, still health is like, you know, there's how many conditions are incurable, you know, is, are they really? I don't think so. It's we just don't know what to do with them. Yeah. It's really interesting how deep we're going and, and, uh, you know, I'm fascinated by it really. And, and I'm, I'm someone who really still feels like, you know, I'm very much a non-interventionist. I like doctors who are not pushing me towards pharmaceuticals. I don't take any pharmaceutical drugs at all. I'm a pretty healthy guy. Uh, and I, I feel like my lifestyle is such that I can stay healthy. The air is clean where I live. The water's great. Uh, I've got good food, eat a lot of salmon, mm, I love <laughs> which, salmon. I, which I consider like the perfect food. It really is the perfect food. Yeah. S especially yeah. smoked salmon. I love that. Oh yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, and I love seafood in general. And, and of course, you know, I grew up out here on the West coast. So seafood was just part of it all. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's just like, you can go downtown Portland to seafood stores and stuff and it is all there, mm -hmm. you know, and reasonably inexpensive compared to a lot of places. Mm. It's beautiful. It is. So I wanted to ask a few questions about some mushroom related things. Oh my God. Do we have to talk about mushrooms? <laughs> <laughs> Just real quick. Um, <laughs> we, we had an amazing, uh, amazing rabbit hole that I really enjoyed. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Okay. So I wanted to ask you real quick about, so something I was reading on your educational piece on your website, uh, you mentioned that a lot of mushroom products contain starch. And that they're grown in like kind of starch medium. Can you talk a little bit about like the liquid culture versus the uh, grain grown difference and which one's more medicinally effective? Well, you know, um, in Asia, they grow a lot of mycelium in liquid culture. And this is nothing new. It's been going on for a long time. Mm -hmm. And and you can you can uh, grow out the mycelium. You know, this, this is the way actually that they produce penicillin in the beginning too because penicillin is a is a imperfect fungus it doesn't produce a mushroom or anything it's a mold mm -hmm. uh, and this particular mold they could put it in liquid culture and it would produce penicillin and and then they could uh, they could basically extract it out of that liquid to a more pure form um, so liquid culture over there is is very standard you can grow masses of mycelium in very very large tanks of liquid strain the liquid off you've got your mycelia there so that is uh, what they do they do sell a lot of it I mean especially with the cordyceps they've got cordyceps products one in particular called CS4 that they've been producing for 40 years and they sell hundreds of tons of it every year over in Asia some of it come makes it its way to North America too pure 100% mycelium 
Mm. So nothing wrong with that. Mycelium actually though, the, the thing about mycelium is, is it doesn't have the level of beta glucans as mm. a mushroom. So it's it, not as medicinally effective. The no, and aspect. it doesn't have, it doesn't really produce the same compounds. Mushrooms are really interesting. They, they have uh, uh, these genetics that will produce all sorts of really complex compounds. I mean, mm. you, just think about even uh, like a psilocybin mushroom why are you producing this strange compound? And, and, you know, people out there are not eating <laughs> psilocybe mycelium or growing it on grain or anything. No, they want the mushroom, right? That's where you really get the, the compounds that you're after. Now, now, again, in North America, what happens, mushrooms are expensive to grow. Um, I can grow mushrooms, put them, take my shiitake down to the market, sell it for $5 a pound, but supplements are dried powders. As soon as I dry out that mushroom, which is 90% water, uh, now I have to get 10 times as much for my dried pound of mushrooms. Instead of $5, I've got to get $50 for that pound of dried mushroom. Wow. Have you ever been in the supermarket and, and looked at, in some places they'll have these little packages of dried mushrooms hanging there and a little display and you go, oh yeah, dried mushrooms. You look at that and it's like, huh, 15 grams for $3? Oh my God, really? Wow. You know, it's, it's like, <clears throat> so it's expensive to grow mushrooms and use them in the supplement market. Mm. Um, there are no mushrooms grown in the United States and put into the supplement market it doesn't happen except small boutique growers or or maybe you know you could go out and you could probably find a, a couple of mushroom growers that are producing shiitake and maybe maitake and you could buy from them and you could produce your own liquid extracts for your clinic and you could put them into the marketplace but when you look at you know like, like on a mass scale or on a mass scale it is not cost effective at all. So that's why what some companies do is they will, they will sterilize grain. Um, they will inoculate it with live mycelium, which grows over the grain in a laboratory in a sterile environment, grows over the grain. And then once it's coated the grain after 30 to 60 days and builds up a little bit of a mass, they will take the whole thing, grain and all, dry it, grind it to a powder, and sell it as a mushroom. Mm. And it's there's a actually, lot of weight there that's just from the grain that they use too. Well, right? well, that's exactly right. Most kind of, of it is the grain. And, and again, the, it's grain with mycelium on it. Uh, but the amount of mycelium is very limited. And how we know is A, by testing for ergosterol, we can test those products for ergosterol. It's about 10% of the ergosterol that we'd see in a mushroom. And it's uh, very close to the same when we look at the, the compared to the actual mushroom, the amount of beta glucans is way down, maybe five or 6% compared to 30 to 50%. Wow. So essentially what you're getting with those products is mostly starch. And look, mushrooms don't contain starch. They have small amounts of glycogen they don't contain starch and these products have 30 to 60% starch in them. So, wow. so when you're buying one of those products, what you're getting is mostly starch and wow. very little fungal matter. And, and that is the, the real issue. And when you look at the label, it shows a picture of a mushroom and it says shiitake mushroom. mushrooms, reishi mushroom, what have you. And unfortunately, 50% of the products in the US market, when you go into the stores, are these types of products because they're grown in the US. And if a product says, if your mushroom product is grown in the US, you know that's what it is. And if you're lucky, maybe they will say mycelium in the fax panel, but in the other ingredients, maybe if you're lucky, they'll say, myceliated rice or myceliated oats, a lot of them will not because, you know, some of these companies that, do, that grow these products and, and have retail product lines, they sell the raw materials to other companies. But when they sell it to other companies, they uh, basically sell it like we were talking about before. They sell it as a mushroom. So these other companies are going, oh, wow, uh, great mushroom product, great presentation. 
I talked to somebody today, actually, that told me about the presentation they got by one of these companies. And they said, man, it was so convincing. I, I was just ready to purchase their products. And then you came along and you, you explained to me what was going on. And I was shocked because I was sure I was getting a mushroom product from these people. Mm. No, it's not a mushroom product. So what you're saying is that typically if a product is grown in the U.S., that not only is it like 30 to 60% grain by weight, but that the rest of it is mostly mycelium? How much of it is actually mushroom? None. None. So, it, so it's basically useless. You know what, what, More what or less. some of these companies, yeah, what some of these companies, yes, I would call it useless because- you know, it's, it's not a fungal product. I mean, it's literally not. And one of the ways you can do a simple test, which is kind of interesting, is just go buy a package of tempeh. Mm -hmm. That's what they're growing. They're growing tempeh. In other words, and tempeh is cooked soybeans with mycelium on it. Fungal mycelium. Take that tempeh and like, okay, slice it up put it in uh, your oven or a dryer, let it dry up and see what you've got. <laughs> you know, you will be shocked when you look and you go, where'd all the mycelium go? Mycelium on that tempeh is going to be 90% water. The, the, the grain, the, the soybeans is going to be, are going to be 50% water. You dry that out. You're going to see a lot of soy <laughs> when that mycelia is just going to kind of be like, what happened? Where'd it go? And wow. that's what, so it's that's not even a lot selling. of mycelium either. No, <laughs> no, you're not. You're not getting hardly any. You're not getting hardly any. And, that, and that's, the, that's the issue with those products. And, and all you have to do is taste them. I mean, you just, if you want to taste those products versus a real mushroom powder, the, the taste is night and day. Mm. Uh, as far as you know of the different uh, mushroom species, does the mycelium have any medicinal properties? Yes, on, on its compounds. own. Yeah, no, on, on its own, it absolutely does. I mean, uh, it does have beta glucans. From what the researchers have shown, and from mm -hmm. what our tests has shown, the level of beta glucans is probably fifty percent uh, of a pure mycelium product. But if it's a pure mycelium product, it's certainly much better than all that grain you're getting in these others so yes mycelium absolutely has got benefits i, I mean you know a lot of the companies say oh oh yeah um but but uh, he's just saying that mycelium is is no good we know it's good and look at all the research with mycelium yeah there's a lot of research with mycelium pure mycelium <laughs> yeah not like not like grain grain no. dope mycelium no 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 yeah. I, mean, I mean there's a little bit of research on, on yeah. that but it's it's very small and it's like why would you want to grow my, you know, it's like, okay, let's grow our, our herb in this beautiful soil. And then once we're done, let's just sell the soil with the herb. Yeah. You know, it's like, no. <laughs> If you're growing mycelium, you don't want to, you know, sell what you're growing it on. Um, and it's funny, some of the companies now are actually saying that their grain is, is like magic starch. I'm not kidding you. They actually will will say, "Oh, look, our our, our uh, um, uh, grain that we're selling you. I mean, we're we've got it's a process, and and they're even saying it's kind of like yogurt, where you know you're turning this thing with this with this uh, uh, microbiological culture. You're turning milk into yogurt. It's like that, or, or even." I've even heard them say, oh, it's kind of like tempeh and you're turning it into something so much better. It's like, yeah, that sounds an awful like marketing speak. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. When I was, when I was reading into that whole rabbit hole, I was pretty, pretty disappointed. I, I know in general, a lot of supplement companies, especially the really, really big ones, they tend to, you know, try to cut their costs at every step of the way. And, you know, learning about a lot of the herbs that come from China, them being filled with all sorts of adulterants and even lead sometimes to add weight to herbs, <laughs> which is like well, so poisonous. Yeah. Well, um, you know what? It's like, that's the, that's the only thing that they have to say about us is they're always saying, Oh, you don't want to get anything from China because uh, all those heavy metals in there yeah. and, and all the rest. And it's yeah. like, no, no, you should never do that. And it's like, 
look, if you're an herbalist, like so many herbs are coming from China. Yeah. You have to test your, you have to test your herbs for heavy metals. We don't sell anything if it doesn't meet heavy metal standards. So it's just a, a real red herring. And, and, you know, I mean, unfortunately, a lot of naturopaths are clueless about this. I mean it clueless because some of these companies have have actually gotten sort of uh, very cozy with naturopathic colleges like the college there in portland mm-hmm. like bastier where they're they've uh, connected with some of the people there and they who knows they probably donated and all of this and and uh, so the naturopaths that come out of there even the young mat- naturopaths they kind of like oh well they're in our dispensary so it must be good or, right, or yeah so it's just unfortunate. Mm. Yeah. So how how do you know if like something coming from China is uh, what the quality and if it's in heavy metals as like a lay consumer or something? Is there can, can you go on their website? Can you call them? How do you actually find out for yourself? Like if I wanted to source a product. Well, you know, uh, you could certainly call the company and try to pin them down. And if you were really serious, you could ask them to see a certificate of analysis analysis from their heavy metal test. If you were really like, oh, I, I so much want to use this product. I've heard such good things about it, but I don't really know. You could uh, finance the test yourself. A heavy metals test will cost you $100. Right, so if you, if you were really serious, you could go, okay, I'm going to buy the product. I'm going to send off a bunch of it to this lab and I'm going to have them do a heavy metals test for me. And then I'll know absolutely. I won't have to talk to somebody or any of that. I'll know. Absolutely. I mean, you know, our, our products are tested twice before they leave China. And actually when they come in, we test them again. We actually use a lab for most of our testing in Portland. Mm. <laughs> they test our products for pesticides. They test it for heavy metals. Sometimes they do microbiological panels for us when we need it. They'll test. We use them for testing all sorts of things. Mm. Are those the basic tests that you would do, like heavy metals, biological you, you, pesticides? You have to do those. We can't sell our products unless they meet certain standards that's just you know a lot of people think oh the supplement industry it's it's like the wild west there's no regulations or anything like that nonsense we have all sorts of regulations that doesn't mean that you can't meet all of those specifications and still sell starchy myceliated grain you can you can still call your product organic kosher um, um, you know, like, uh, non-GMO, uh, gluten-free on and on and on. You can have all of those badges and it's still not necessarily a good product. Right. But it just is more or less safe, even if it's useless. Hey, you know, you know, here's, here's the interesting thing is that, is that we've, we do the, uh, like a nutritional analysis of our mushrooms. So we've got um, fat, protein, carbohydrate, then we'll add uh, to that like beta-glucan, alpha-glucan. Well, when we did that, we get a profile of what that mushroom, because we're testing the actual mushroom. Okay, here's the the profile. We then um, test through, let's just say three products that are these myceliated grain products. But what we do is we will put up the profile of the grain that they're grown on. Mm -hmm. Then we'll put, then we'll analyze them for the same nutritional components. And that's just called approximate analysis. Mm. Okay. These products track the grain perfectly. Okay. What that tells you is that they are primarily grain because the fat is exactly the same. The protein is the same, the carbohydrate level, the same, the, as the grain. (laughs) So it's just tracking that grain perfectly. Hmm. That's, that's wild to, uh, to finish off. I wanted to ask you uh, a question about 
a potential uh, revolution in mushrooms that's going on, especially here in uh, Oregon. So, uh, oh, you've in, got this on your on your uh, you're voting on this this year, right? This yep, is just the in, psil in, psilocybin initiative or the mushroom initiative. Exactly. Is it, yeah. It's is it uh, for November. Actual, is it actually for the mushroom itself or psilocybin? How have they presented it? It's uh, from what I understand, it's for psilocybin um, mushroom. I don't know if they made any specification on if it like, is it the extracted or in its whole form? I'm not sure about that, but what it would set up uh, it's being voted on in November is the therapeutic use of it. So somebody would have to go through some kind of special training, get a certificate, and then they could give this psilocybin therapy to people. Uh, so Probably it's like in a medical context. So this is kind of like uh, uh, the same model used for um, marijuana. Yeah, exactly. For cannabis. Yeah, they're trying that same approach. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It just narrowly got on the ballot because of all the COVID stuff. Like, because they had to like have people mail in letters because they weren't like accepting anything else. So, but they made it. So if you're in Oregon and you believe in, you know, the power of psychedelics to heal, definitely go out there and, and vote yes on. I, uh, I forget what the exact number is. There's a lot of different numbers. It's like IP something like 42. Or and do they like have that. any any polling that they've done to date that shows whether they think it's going to pass or not? I don't know, actually. That's a good question. I'll have to I'll have to look into that. Yeah, I would I would assume that maybe they've got something like that. And I suspect and didn't they was this on the ballot before as well and didn't pass? I think I think so. Yeah, I think it didn't pass last time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, can I come down and vote? <laughs> if you can, please, please do. That would be amazing. <laughs> well, I mean, my mother was born in Portland. So does that does that help me out at all? Is she still on the rolls? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's, what is it? 2020. Okay, it's Oregon Measure 109 Psilocybin Mushroom Services Program Initiative. Allows manufactured delivery administration of psilocybin as at supervised licensed facilities, imposes two year development period, result of yes vote, allows manufacturer, blah, blah, blah. No vote retains current law. Well, I, I suppose what will happen is it'll be licensed for either uh, psychiatrists, uh, certain psychologists, and maybe physicians. And, and maybe you guys got to jump on the bandwagon and have a license naturopath be able yeah. to do it as well that'd be very yeah cool. that would be that would be amazing i mean if if it became legalized i would very much use that in a large portion of my practice just because of my own experiences and because i do specialize in mental health and yeah. i don't really know of any i don't know of any medicine outside of you know the medicinal mushrooms of course there's several herbs but the you know psilocybin things like that they can have the most impact out of everything absolutely Absolutely. They've demonstrated that in all the studies that they've done. And, and I, I think too, it's just like, you know what, we've known that for a long time. It's just, yeah. that they, they prohibition came along and yeah, it's, <laughs> it really it's nothing new. Shamanic cultures knew about the spiritual uh, psychological healing effects of these plants for thousands, if not tens, if not hundreds of thousands of years. Absolutely. So it's, absolutely. Yeah. There's, that's, there's no that's, question. Well, so, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I will be following that closely. I sure hope it passes. That would be fantastic, especially if it's statewide, because it, currently it's only like in a couple of cities. I think it's Oakland and Denver, where they've passed a, a city ordinance or law of some sort that says, okay, in the city you can use it, um, but uh, recreationally, I think even. But I, I'm not sure exactly. But, but uh, so this would be fantastic. It'd be a, a great first step. Yeah, it's called IP34. I'll, if I'll anyone's interested look it up. yeah i'll definitely look it up that's really interesting yeah as far as voting it may be the only thing i actually vote for this year yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i know i i hear you i i don't uh i don't get involved in u.s politics anymore i mean i, I used to you know vote democrat but it's, these days I, I just don't you know i don't want to be involved in any party i don't have any party allegiance or anything Same. like that yeah i, I, I agree I with just, you yeah. I do have an allegiance towards a therapeutic use of psilocybin, though. I will say Me that too. much. Me <laughs> awesome. too. Yep, yep, yep. We're going to form a party, okay? <laughs> Let's do it. Uh, call it the mushroom party. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Every candidate is required to go through a rigorous a series of 20 five-gram dose experiences before they're allowed to be a candidate. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Our party is cool. mushrooming. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Um, 
Well, thank you, Jeff. Uh, really appreciate the conversation. Where uh, where can people find your products or learn more about what you do? Well, come to namex.com, N-A-M-M-E-X.com or realmushrooms.com. Namex is the business to business. We've got a lot of good information there. So please come and view our educational section. Same with Real Mushrooms too. I mean, you can buy, buy products retail at uh, Real Mushrooms, um, but it's also got a lot of great info. So definitely check it out. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Jeff Chilton of Namex. Thank you for having me. It's been great being here the second time, and, and it's always a pleasure. Yeah, we'll have to do a, we'll have to do even another one. Hopefully, uh, next time we talk, this uh, you know initiative will have gone through. We can talk about that. Absolutely, that'd be very cool. All right, thank you.